Dr. Matlock, our, our speaker here this morning, actually um, had Dr. Borlaug as a mentor uh, many years ago. And so if you're looking for a mentor on tackling global issues and fighting food insecurity, uh, there's there's probably no no better mentor that you could probably have than Dr. Norman Borlaug. So that's an interesting connection that I didn't even realize whenever we invited Dr. Matlock to speak with us today. So that's pretty, pretty neat. But uh, Dr. Matlock comes to us from uh, the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Uh, he's, he's promised that he won't do any pig suey shouts while he's here, so appreciate that. Uh, otherwise, we may have to throw a cowbell at you, but um, but we're excited to have him. He's, uh, uh, he's a professional engineer. He's also certified in several other engineering areas, and uh, he received his PhD from Oklahoma State University, of course, in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And uh, he has uh, won several prestigious awards, over over 30 national and international honors, one of which in 2018, he was a, a, a Cass Borlaug Communications uh, Award winner. So that's a pretty prestigious honor and we're excited to have him. And he's gonna talk to us about how do we deal with food insecurity on a global scale? What are the issues and how do we tackle that moving forward? So it's very much in line with the Youth Institute and what we're doing today. So with that, Dr. Matlock, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. Right, we're going to switch mics to the lavalier mics so that I don't hear them talk of feedback. There we go. Can you hear me okay online too? Some of the thumbs up from someone online. Good. So, all right. So, I'm Marty Matlock. I grew up in Oklahoma, first generation college student, member of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, our Cherokee greeting is Osio. So, everyone, Osio. And when we like something, our sort of right on or darn right or see you later is sort of a universal is wado wado so now you've learned two cherokee words uh you got a couple of thousand more before you can talk but the language but it, it, all journeys start with the first step so let's see what we got to do here so here's our challenge everything is connected and this is something that my cherokee grandfather and father taught me it's just part of our cultural identity and it's it's actually part of your understanding of the world now. My generation, I'm 61, when I was your age, this wasn't so self-evident. In fact, we were still pretty siloed in our understanding of the world and how we learned and interacted and made decisions. Now, interdisciplinary thinking is part of your standard way of learning. And part of it's because you've got the cell phone in your pocket, which connects you to all the knowledge of the ages from every discipline and around the world. And so that creates this sense that everything is connected. Everyone is connected to, and everything is changing. And that rate of change is faster than anything even you have experienced. How many of you have younger siblings? They're gonna be smarter than you by the time they're half your age. Now, the reason that's the case is because their rate of learning and their rate of exposure and knowledge is, is accelerating so fast. Everything is changing, and the rate of change means that you have to work harder to keep up. I just gave up. I'm 61. I don't have to worry about it anymore. You're going to be paying my salary in four years, right? That's one of the challenges we're going to get to because we're all in this together. And there's a bunch of us on the planet, a bunch of us. You heard this morning that when doc, when I was an, uh, an undergraduate in, 19, in the 1980s, we had about 4 billion people on the planet. We're over 8 billion now. It's changing fast and we're all in this together. We have a set of goals that we share as humanity. The United States or United Nations developed sustainable development goals. These are the things that we all as, as, a, as a group of civilized nations have agreed are our priorities, the things we should be working on in every part of our, of our uh, civil engagement. That's, so, that's both social, uh, economic, that's the industry part, the, the commerce part, as well as government should be working on these things. And they're not complicated. They're hard, but they're not complicated. We should end poverty. We should end hunger. We should bring good health and well-being to all people. There are 16 basic goals, and the 17th goal is the most important partnerships to achieve these things because everything's connected and everything's changing, and we're all in this together. Now, one of the challenges we have is these goals are intention. If we're going to end hunger, we're going to have to produce more food, or we're going to have to produce use more water or we may have to use more land, or we may have to use more energy, which creates greenhouse gases. So these tensions are difficult. And one of the things we have to do, and your generation especially, is to make choices, wise choices. Scientists and engineers do not make these choices, citizens do. 
citizens do through in, in, in our civil democracies, through our legislatures, through our representatives. So it's important that you understand that these choices are gonna drive your and your and, and your subsequent generation's well-being, the way we make these choices. They're not, again, these are not complicated questions. They're complicated solutions. And we had you guys, I'm doing now what you guys did earlier. It's a little longer. I don't just get four minutes. I get about, I'm gonna use about 30 minutes to do the same thing. But I'm posing challenges the whole world faces rather than uh, targeted countries or communities, which you guys discussed earlier. And let me tell you, my group, fantastic job. I'm sure the rest of you did the same. So here's our challenge with global population. I'm sure you guys are fairly familiar with this challenge. So we're here about 20, just about here. We're just over 8 billion. Um, where we go next, the reason we have this gray line is because it's uncertain where we go next. Where we go next is really a function of economic prosperity because the number of children a woman has in her lifetime is really a function of her choices and access to income around the world. This is something that Dr. Borlaug understood very well, giving women financial security from life from the land, because that's where most women in the world then and still now got their financial security. Giving women financial security gave them better choices. And women who have better choices often have fewer children and spend more resources on the children they have. How many of you have more than five siblings? Good for you, that's amazing. I'd be proud, you have more than five. Big families are great. I only had two. But how many of your parents had more than five siblings? All the old folks back here all raising their hands. Yeah, how many of your grandparents had more than five siblings? So what, I, I just conducted a, a survey, I collected data, and my conclusion is you guys all hate children. No, the conclusion is that when we have choices, why did, why did our grandparents have lots of kids? Because the children were the economic buffer and solution for the land. They were the labor force for the family unit. The family unit for human species and the family is defined not just as the nuclear mom and dad, but it's also quite, quite broad to the extended family, uh, always has been. Uh, you might call that a village or you might call that a community, but it's always because historically our communities were all our cousins. And in fact, in, in Indian country, we refer to everybody as cousins and ain't far from the truth. Uh, and so what, what we learned from that is that uh, when we have hard times, when we need labor, when we need to produce crops, we need people. And the people are often our children and our, our uh, siblings' children, our larger community. As we have become more mechanized, some would say modernized, I would just say mechanized, what we have done is we've reduced the demand for labor on the farm and therefore the demand for children. And that means you have more resources per family unit than your grandparents did. Does that make it easier? No, because the demand for those resources is higher, but it makes it different. So I just wanna make it clear that what Norman Borlaug recognized in 1948 was that a population monster was gonna eat the planet because of that Malthusian curve, Thomas Malthus said, we are increasing our population greater than, faster than we're increasing our food production. If we don't figure out how to get ahead of it, we are gonna eat the planet. And the planet won't survive, mainly we won't survive. Earth is gonna be fine. 10,000 years from now, if humans are extinct, Earth will be here, unless there's a you know, meteorite or something. Earth will be here. So what we're fighting for is human civilization. What we're struggling to create is human prosperity, a vision of human prosperity that is not Mad Max and Thunderdome. God, that's a reference you guys probably don't even know, do you? Uh, all right, so yeah, that's the problem I'm having. See, I'm 61. So here we are. What's gonna determine this is how prosperous the world is. Prosperity isn't wealth. Some of the happiest places on the planet, the most prosperous places on the planet aren't wealthy, but they're happy. People are engaged. They're engaged with their communities. Costa Rica is an example. The places where people, find a sense of purpose in their lives and, and, and work those purposes to, to betterment. In my uh, culture, and, and it's common to all of us, is to be good ancestors. That is the best compliment we can get. They were a good ancestor. So here's the other challenge, and this is what I alluded to earlier when I said you guys are gonna be paying my wages. Uh, we're getting old as a planet. It's a demographic reality. There was a whole lot of babies born about 50, 60 years ago, 
and all those babies are my age now, and there are fewer babies born after that because our population growth rate is coming down, which is a good thing. The problem with that is the people, there are fewer people coming behind to carry our burden. And what is our burden going to be? Some of you talked about those burdens. Healthcare. Uh, we were already admit, admonishing one of our uh, one of our scholars to not uh, make a career in taking care of babies, but make a career in taking care of older folks. Because yeah, we're, it's, we're, it's all about us. So that's one of the challenges you're going to have. They're going to, and this is global. This is not just in the U.S. This is global. An aging population. Now, an aging population isn't all bad. We're we're smarter in some ways. We're wiser, but we're less productive. And that's going to be a challenge. And it's, I wish I could give you a reason that, or an alternative for that. I'd rather not. So uh, this is what we have. So our 25 to 64 age group is sort of your group. It's growing. You guys are in the uh, 15 to 24. Some of you are in the 14 to 24 range now. But that's flatlining for the future. Here's 2025 now. 65-year-olds uh, getting much bigger. So that's going to be a challenge. What do you do? Demographics are destiny. You, you, we adapt. We have to understand. We have to create ways to feed ourselves that don't require muscle. That's the fun, foundational challenge there because there won't be young people to do the physical toil. And that population isn't going to be equally distributed. Those folks, those 2 billion people, 8 billion people now will be 10 billion people. Those extra 2 billion people coming to dinner aren't going to be from around here. They're going to be from, whoops, they're going to be from mostly Africa, Asia outside of India and Pakistan, though India is still growing, or India and China. It's really Africa, Asia, and Central and South America. That's where our population growths are going to be. Many of you address issues and challenges in these countries in your, in your uh, discussions. Incredibly important. We have to understand these issues. There are a number of reasons. For the benefit of our sort of larger uh, society, yes, but also, if you're going to be in business of commerce, where are your customers are going to come from in the next 20 years? Not from around here. That means you're going to learn, have to learn other cultures, other languages, other ways of exchange. It's a global economy, and your new customers aren't coming from around here. So back to our sustainable development goals. These are pretty critical. Let's talk about hunger and poverty. Many of you in our group talked about the relationship between hunger and poverty. It's unambiguous. You can tell poor people are the reason uh, we have hunger in the world still. There's still, I mean, yes, war and environmental disruption are critical factors too, but poverty takes away your resiliency. Poverty doesn't give you a next. Poverty makes you right on the edge of survival at any given day. I know because I grew up with a family on the edge of survival in Oklahoma. My grandparents were Dust Bowl survivors. Uh, it's a hard thing. And this guy, Noam Borlaug, Food is the moral right of all who are born into this world, a moral right. Why? Without food, you have no sustenance. Without no sustenance, you have no existence. If we truly believe in the value of human life, and I think we all do, then we should be providing food for all who are born. Now, why do we provide it? Because they're too young to work for it. I mean, this, the John Smith solution here, Adam Smith, I'm sorry, Adam Smith's solution here of everybody working for their food is fine once you're, I don't know, 12. But when you're, what do we do for the those who are newborn? Not enough. Not enough in Mississippi. Not enough in Arkansas. Not enough in Afghanistan. Not enough in India. Not enough in England. Not enough anywhere. This is one of our major challenges, and it causes cascading problems. And this is the fight that Norm worked on. Now let me tell you a little bit about my my mentor, Norm. He's about this tall. He was a Norwegian a great grandson. Father was Norwegian immigrant. He still had talked with a Norwegian clip, his, uh, uh, sort of had a bit of an accent. Um, he did not get into the University of Minnesota when he applied out of high school. He failed the entrance exam. He had to go to what would be now called a junior college or a community college for two years before they would let him in. This is the most famous agricultural scientist in the history of humanity, and he didn't get into college. Uh, he had to go to junior college. That sings to me because it means there's hope for all of us. It's not about what you know, it's what you're willing to work towards, what you're willing to learn. And he worked his guts out. 
really didn't, his, his real work ethic, he, would t he told me, didn't kick in until he was probably in his mid-20s. Why is that? Because this part of your brain doesn't develop till you're 25. You guys are still figuring stuff out. So be a little kind to yourselves. Of course you're doing what your grandparents might say are silly things. Of course you are, because you're kids. And probably are till you're 25. And that's a challenge all humans face. Some of you are going to have to grow up earlier, faster. My dad did. My dad's father, my Cherokee grandfather died when my dad was 12. He had to grow up fast. So, and that, that's another challenge we face around the world. So Norm also was, um, was very concerned about communities as the mechanism of change. In the last 20 years of his life, he spent working at the community level. He would spend all summers going to Mexico, Central America, working with small communities because he felt, felt like change occurs at the community, not at the global scale, not even at the national scale, at the small community scale. And I think he was right. There's wisdom there. How many extension folks do we have in the room? Let's give them a round of applause because that's what they're doing. Agricultural extension is the unsung hero of American prosperity. And I would dare say underfunded as well. So here's our challenge. Global food supply chain is the most extensive human endeavor in history. Why is that? Well, there are 8 billion of us on the planet today and we each, you're just after that breakfast and what you guys are gonna have for lunch today, eating a bunch of calories. Um, and so you're gonna eat maybe 2000 kilocalories, actually call it calories, but they're kilocalories a day. Um, and so just do the math. Ultimately, we process, transport, distribute, and consume nearly 22 million tr kilocalories, trillion kilocalories of food to people every single day, every single day. That's what our global food supply chain does. Now, 900 million of our brothers and sisters are chronically malnourished. That's because they make less than two bucks a day because they're poor. Not because they don't have access to food, but because they're poor. Now, there are reasons some people don't have access to foods and that's, that are not economic, but generally not. Now, here's our other challenge. Because we have this big endeavor, this global issue, it consumes the world, literally. Agriculture is at the heart of our global challenges. If we look at sort of this radar diagram with the red radar sweeps as the issues that are most concerning, we have biodiversity loss, we have global nitrogen flows or cycles, and emerging climate changes. The green zone are places we can op occupy safely. Everything outside of those zones are unsafe spaces. And food explicitly, biosphere integrity, nitrogen and phosphorus application are major concerns, greenhouse gas emissions, cropland use, fresh water use. So these are our challenges. How do we keep feeding ourselves? These are the ways we do it. And by the way, if you want these slides, uh, Daryl said he'll be happy to share them with you. I don't think I can email them because they're probably too big with all the pictures, but Daryl will be happy to share them or put them in a place where you can get them. Uh, so we currently live here. These are our cities, the big red dots, the bigger the dots, the bigger the cities. In 25 years, 2030, no, 10, eight, six years. So this is what's happening. We are becoming, we're an urban species. 54% of us live in cities. Problem with living in cities is it's hard to be a sustained, a, a subsistence agriculture producer in a city. Uh, that exacerbates the, pro, the, the process of food insecurity in, a multiple, in multiple dimensions. Human activities already dominate 45% of our surface. 45%. This is what this looks like. So Earth's surface is 29% land, 71% ocean. 76% of, of that land is habitable because some of it's in glaciers or barren land, like the empty uh, zone of the, of the Sahara Desert. 45% of, of, of this habitable land is in agriculture. 45%, 38% in forest, 13% in shrubs. And then we have urban and built up and water bodies. Of that agricultural land, 80% of that is in grazing land. So it's land that's generally not tillable, won't produce enough. It's like my ancestors found Oklahoma was. Oklahoma looked like a great place to till the prairie and grow cotton. And it worked for about 10 years. Uh, then it stopped working because it wasn't really arable. Uh, it's great for grazing, though. And if people say meat is bad for you or meat is bad for the planet, I respect people's differences of opinions. I just disagree. Without animal agriculture, 
take away 80%, 80% of our production from the land to produce calories for humanity. They take animals, especially our, our um, bovines and others take um, uh, relatively low uh, stuff we can't eat, grass, and they make high quality protein, fat, and micronutrients for us. We have to respect them, but that's what they do. So of our global calorie, 17% comes from uh, livestock, 83% from plant-based, but 38% of our protein comes from uh, livestock. So, and trying to replace, trying to replace all that livestock protein with plant protein, plant proteins are intensive resources because they take lots of nitrogen because protein is nitrogen and that makes it problematic. Now here's what's happened with land use change. Land use change follows um, human population growth. Land use change has gone up dramatically. I was born in 1960, right? And, and it's gone up dramatically in my lifetime. Land use change is driving species extinction. Species are going, we're just losing. We're losing the biosphere at an incredible rate. And it's not just polar bears and elephants. We're losing lots of things at an incredibly fast rate. And guess where it's the hottest? Right here in the tropics. That was a pun. Extinction is the hottest. It's hard to laugh about extinction, isn't enough. But right here in the, in the, because we have, this is the places with the rainforest, the highest species diversity indices, but also the most arable land left, the places we haven't tilled yet. But as some of you pointed out in our session today, we're tilling that now. We're converting it to agriculture to meet those food demands and those economic demands. And the result is we're seeing in these tropical areas, the highest rates of extinction of animals, the highest rates. The regional threats to populations and the Living Planet Index from World Wildlife Fund, I work closely with them, is habitat loss and degradation, uh, species overexploitation. In Africa, the phrase often is in West Africa, if it moves, it's meat. Invasive species and disease, pollution, and then climate change. Boy, climate change. So you guys know these stories. Oops, see if this will activate. Can you activate this in the booth? I'm not sure it will, it may not. If it doesn't, that's okay. Yeah, click it there, there we go. That's media not found, all right, no worries. So you won't see the graphics here, but get the slides, go to NASA and look up climate change and you can see what climate change is. This is part of you guys' standard curricula. Some of us don't see this. And then this one, I don't think is gonna work either. My current, the media didn't translate with it when I downloaded the files. Sorry about that, but actually fine. That shortens it up. Time check, where am I? You're good at time checking. Look at your watch. 27, okay, good. All right, so water. If climate change is a shark, water is its teeth. Water is the thing that affects agriculture the most. Well, why is that? What is food from the land? It's sunlight, phytochemical energy, photons, chemically transported into chemicals, I mean, chemically transported into carbohydrates, proteins, and some fats, with water bringing nutrients from the soils, the nutrients are in the soil that the, the plant needs, and water transports it up and facilitates the reaction. When you eat food, you're eating sunlight and water and soil in that order, water being the second highest uh, uh, part. Even if the food is dried, it took water to get it there before it was dried. So we are seeing water insecurity. The US, we're actually pretty good. And in fact, many states uh, are gonna experience um, wetter wets, not drier dries in the US. Our Western cousins in the US, looks like they're gonna get drier dries because climate change means wetter wets, drier dries, hotter hots, colder colds more extreme weather. And the, the, the drier dries and the wetter wets, California's getting all of it. They got uh, droughts, means they got no water. Then they get atmospheric rivers, which means they got two feet of water running down streets that never flooded before. That's what we're seeing with climate change. Now that's hard enough on urban areas. For agricultural producers, it's a freaking disaster because we produce our crops, in the, certainly in the temperate zones, 
between this this sort of spring to fall window of about 180 days, and you know we're, it's getting warmer earlier, so we got maybe 190 days of growing season, but it's wet sometimes well into May, so you can't get in the field with a tractor to plant your crops. So think about what that means. Just disruption after disruption. Now think about what a global drought means. And global drought means, uh, in fact, the Arab Spring, which happened 14 years ago. Okay, you guys were four, uh, two. When the Arab Spring happened, that was probably more, that was just a climate change response. There were droughts in the Mideast, food shortages. The price of food was sky, price of bread was skyrocketing. You know anything about the French Revolution? Well, the same thing happened and it still will happen. That's the reason every country that's stable has a cheap food policy because he learned from the French and the Arab Spring was a really a food riot. It was a food riot. And it resulted in ultimately um, uh, 3 million migrants moving out of uh, Middle East and Mediterranean countries into Europe, which resulted in, in a huge pr political pressure in the United Kingdom because once you get into Europe, it's like getting the United States, you can go state to state. In Europe, you can go country to country without a passport. So once people got in through Turkey, typically, or Greece, boom, they went to where the jobs were, and that was Scandinavia, Germany, and England, the United Kingdom, and also where the best social benefits were. So they went there, overloaded those systems. The United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union for that reason. Think about that. Climate change caused a political disruption in Europe uh, that was effectively a country leaving their system. Water stress due to agriculture is gonna happen mostly here. That's where we're projecting it. That's where the, that's the, the drier dries. All right, remember where the people are gonna be? Well, if you don't remember, here's where the people are gonna be. So that's your challenge. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, remember where we got, where we came from, find out where we're going. In 1950, when Norm started this work, 30% of humanity was chronically malnourished. And half of us were food insecure, half of humanity still in the ashes of World Wars I and II. Things were chaotic around the world in Asia, Africa, as well as India and, the, and uh, North America and South America. So this is the world Borlaug was working on in, and this is the problem he's working to solve. This is a picture I took in China before COVID. Only 11% of humanity is hungry now, only 11%. Now it's still horrible that 11% of humanity is chronically malnourished, but boy, is that better. 1950, global child mortality, death before five years of age was greater than 22%. Today it's 4%. Now we can never take this for granted, but it's 4%. We're making progress. This isn't my grandparents, but it could be. This is the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma across the, uh, the heartland of the US for agricultural productions. A, a, a drought of record like we had in 2011 in 1928 caused this. A, globe, a, a national eco, Agroecosystem disaster. It was an absolute disaster. And it brought the soil conservation now NRCS agencies to, to be as a national response. We responded and we we're reducing soil erosion locally to nationally to globally. Now, this only goes to 2012, but the problem is we kind of flatlined. And that's why uh, I, I served as a senior advisor to Secretary Tom Vilsack. Uh, the beginning of the Biden administration. And one of the things we implemented was the Climate Smart Ag Program as part of the American Recovery Program to spend money to, to give farmers resources to continue to reduce soil erosion. Soil erosion is the greatest threat to agricultural sustainability of any metric. Prosperity from land creates opportunities for people to improve their lives and the lives of their children. It's a human endeavor and it gives us hope. In 1950, more than 44% of the world was uneducated, illiterate. 86% 86 of humanity can read and write today, 86%. That happened in two lifetimes. Now, we can do these things is what I'm trying to say, because you look at all the data and, and it's often tempting to become nihilistic. Oh, look how terrible things are. You guys really messed it up for us. Oh yeah, you're right, but we're also working to fix it and our grant, just like our grandparents did. So your job is to become good ancestors. How did your grandparents do it? Our grandparents, probably your great grandparents, sweat and science. This is what Borlaug was engaged in. It's hard work. Even the process of, this, of learning the science is hard work. You guys have already stepped into that arena with your work today. U.S. farmers and ranchers, the landowners who keep the resources that we need to be prosperous as a nation, 
already working on these issues with sustainable development goals collectively and individually. Of course we are because US ag producers invented sustainable agriculture. We are aggressively um, adoptive of new technologies as long as they work. And that's what leads us to your future in agriculture. My gosh, it, everything from remote sensing and, and systems modeling and analysis to automation controls and robotics. That's how, when there are no more 18 year old kids to pick your vegetables in California, you're gonna have vegetables. Um, because we won't be, we, because our demographics are destiny. And frankly, it frees humanity from the toil of agricultural production and allows those 18 year old kids instead to learn how to repair and program and manage computers and, and robots. A better future for everyone in agriculture. Look what we've done with yields of crops. Uh, potatoes, boy, what a success story. They've been a success story since they were discovered in the Colombian exchange by Europeans in the, 14, in the 1500s. Potatoes, maize, another success story. If it weren't for my ancestors who were here already developing the genetics for these two crops, the world would be really hungry. So yay, Native Americans. All from, from Tierra del Fuego and, and at the tip of Antarctica to the North Pole. Yay, Native Americans. Uh, rice, wheat, soybeans, sugar beets, and the labor inputs required, boy, they've dropped radically. My grandfather worked a team of mules to, produce, to plow cotton in Oklahoma. And when he got his first John Deere tractor, it changed his life. So land inputs to agriculture have dropped. That means less land pressure, more land for other life. Total agricultural outputs have increased. And if we look at this radar diagram, greenhouse gas, land use, soil erosion, irrigation, water use, energy use, from the outside in, this, we call this the sustainability footprint of agriculture. Over from 1980 to, to 2020, look how much we've reduced our impacts. This is just for corn. We've done the same for cotton, soy, potatoes, wheat. Uh, erosion is still a problem. Look, erosion is kind of our ability to reduce erosion is flatline. That's why we put $700 million in climate smart agriculture resources at that problem. That's what we do as a people. We see a problem. We collectively, through our tax dollars, work to fix it. And we didn't, we're, this money isn't going to people like me, it's going to farmers. Farmers working with other regional uh, experts. Now, poverty is the most insidious thing. The problem with poverty is you know, we all live in ecosystems and those ecosystems support our social systems which support our economic systems. Without one, you, without the ecosystem, you don't have a social system. When there's a natural disaster, social systems fail. Without a social system, think of a war, you don't have an economic system. Inequity is one of our real issues. These are hard problems for this generation, your generation. We've been working on these problems, best estimates 10,000 years. We're better, but we're not good yet. So here's where I'll leave you, and, I want, and I've got questions for you. I hope you have questions for me. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we've come to our real work, and that's where you are. And when we no longer know which way to go, we've begun our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. Boy, my mind is baffled. The impeded stream is the one that sinks. That's Wendell Berry, one of my favorite um, natural resource writers and poets. So with that, I will take questions. How do I do time-wise? Five minutes over. I didn't do as well as you guys did in your presentations. I went a little over. So, so switch to the podium line, turn your back up. So you don't. There we go. That's all. And I'll go to the podium mic. All right. Any questions for Dr. Matt? Right down here. Right down here. Right down here. All right. We got, got a mic because there are people online who want to hear the question. Okay. If we're more financial secure today than ever before, why does the population keep growing? Think about where the population, that's a great question. Well, first of, first of all, because I was only joking, we do love children. I would love to have um, 10 kids. My Muskogee Creek wife said no. Nah. So, you know, <laughs> so, and remember, because we're a predominantly matrilineal culture, all she has to do to put me out is put my stuff on the doorstep and I'm done. So, so I yes, her nah -uh means something. But it's largely it's because of, Places that are not economically secure. Mali has some of the highest fertility rates on the planet still, 7.8 children on average 
per woman. Now, any of the women in this room who have had children, I'm not going to point you out and ask you to testify, but can attest to just how physically difficult uh, bringing a life onto, into this uh, universe is. It's not easy for women. In fact, it was the dominant cause of mortality for women up until the 1960s, and in some places still is, and in some places in the United States, amazingly still is. So those are hard things. But this is, so the short answer to you, your question is what Borlaug knew in 1950, poverty, poverty, because you, that's the only mechanism you have to achieve any sort of financial stability is to increase the productivity of your family. And the only way to do that is increase the numbers. If you give them better choices, better options, they make better choices. Behind you there. An economics student, as I recall, from Idaho. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, Mississippi is a top catfish producing state. I'm curious where you see that and other aquaculture initiatives playing into feeding the global population. I think aquaculture is, the United States imports 96% of, it, of its fins, claws, and flippers. We import all of our, of our uh, seafood or freshwater food, all of our fish and fish stuff. Uh, aquatic stuff. Uh, why do we do that? Because the regulations, frankly, I'm a, I'm all for government regulations, but the regulations in this sector kill any aquaculture initiatives. Those Mississippi catfish farmers can tell you they fight a daily battle to not be uh, hammered for doing what they do. And it's not that it's there. It's not that anybody is free of impact. We all have impacts on the land and they probably have impacts on the land too, but there's some, it's just this regulatory uh, layer. That's the complexity in the US. I've been working on that for 20 years to try to reduce that. Here's the, the good news. Aquaculture represents our greatest potential to create high quality, healthy protein. It doesn't it has omega threes and, and to do it in the most, most sustainable way possible without uh, the buffalo hunt that's going on in the oceans right now. Right now we are dredging the oceans from the bottom to the top, Atlantic, Pacific, Mediterranean everywhere of life. And then we fill it, we're replacing that with plastic. Bad things. So the, the, the short answer to your question is, if I were your age, I would be looking into aquaculture. I'd probably go to Europe or Chile to do it, where you have Europe because you have better markets, Chile because you have uh, the Pacific Ocean and you have a, a much better uh, production environment and you can export to the United States. And I would be raising all sorts of fish uh, the Walton Family Foundation, Christy Walton, has an aquaculture facility off of uh, the coast of Hawaii, of the Big Island of Hawaii, where they're grow growing yellowtail, which is a, a white fish that normally wasn't grown in captivity. They raise them from eggs into their fry, then they put them in pens in the ocean, and the currents in that ocean take any of the nutrients out of the deep water. So there's no environmental impact. In fact, there's an environmental benefit because the deep waters are devoid of nutrients, and that helps to enhance other life in that without polluting it because yeah, it is still a big ocean. And so, yes, I think aquaculture is perhaps one of the most exciting areas of protein production in the world, and we have to stop wild caught fisheries because they are inherently unsustainable. We have a question online. So it says, if I can read it, with the predictions presented, it seems that we are clearly on the way to eat the planet as mentioned earlier. How do we implement sustainable production taking into account the growing population, are we condemned? We are not condemned, we're already successful. We already produce enough food, feed, fiber, and fuel for 8 billion plus people. The reason we have hunger today is economic and social dysfunction, not agricultural production. When I, when I finished my bachelor's degree in agronomy at Oklahoma State, I asked Dr. Borlaug, what, what, where should I go to grad school for agronomy to help feed the world? He said, agronomy, he said, agronomy is your best degree you can get. There's agronomists in the, in the room. It's the best degree you can get for an undergraduate degree to prepare you for these complex problems. But hunger is no longer an agronomic problem. It's an economic problem. And I said, uh, thank you, Dr. Borlaug, but I will not become an, an economist. So, uh, so I, I got a master's degree in plant physiology working on, on wheat to, aluminum toxicity and wheat growth. To, uh, but and then I became an engineer to work on I'm a biosystems engineer to work on that side. So the sim simple answer is we're not doomed, we're already succeeding. We're already succeeding beyond our wildest imagination. Our biggest problems are well-intended but ill-informed people who think that the way we produce our food is bad. Now, 
ain't nothing free in this world and anyone who tells you otherwise is selling something. What is the truth though, is that the way we produce our food in the United States with high technology, including our genetics with and including our herbicides and pesticides and including our tillage systems is the most sustainable in the world. Do we have improvements to make? Heck yeah, you saw, we're still eroding soil. Any farm that's eroding soil is just biding its time to death. It's just, I grew up in Oklahoma. I can tell you what happens eventually. Maybe you'll graze a few cows on that barren land if you keep eroding your soil. And I don't care if your soil's 10 foot deep in Iowa, it will eventually erode. Now, the good news is it'll go downstream and you're downstream. Uh, but the bad news is that and all of our soils, by the way, they went to Kansas. You're welcome. Uh, and for in the 30s because of the winds, southwesterly winds. So the short answer to that question is what we have to do is teach the world how to grow because the biggest problems we have in agricultural production efficiency and effectiveness are lack of economic prosperity because we're still growing in subsistence ways. We work to introduce genetically modified corn into South Africa as a trial to evaluate its economic impact. The farmers there made twice the profit of the conventional production. And are we surprised? Heck no, because that's the reason our farmers use it mostly because they make twice the yield, because it gets rid of, at a very inexpensive cost, gets rid of many of the pest penalties associated with it. If you reduce chemical pest control, and we're finishing a study right now for, uh, for Crop Life America, if you finish, if, if you remove pest controls from chemical pest controls from US agriculture, corn, wheat, and soy, you will increase their environmental impacts, make it worse by 30 to 50%, because you just decrease the yield put the same inputs in, get less out. That means that's just bad, right? That's what's happening around the world. If you can take the, the woman who grows a hectare of soil, and who was it to explain what a hectare was in, in our session? Raise your hand, I think one of you guys explained it's the size of a football, two football fields, right? That's a hectare. If you, uh, if you take a hectare of soil, of corn in, in anywhere in the world, but let's say Mali, and you double the yield on that, Think what you've done to that woman's family, just doubling that yield. What do you have to do to double that yield? Maybe a little bit of pesticide, maybe a little 10, 20, 10 nitrogen, phosphorus, potass, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer, and maybe even hand irrigation right, or hand pump irrigation for across that space. And you've made that woman now resilient because she has enough to feed her family and sell a little bit or use it to feed livestock. And now she's suddenly resilient. So hope is what we have but sweats what we need. Yes, Dr. Thomason, let me. Oh, how do we solve the solar erosion problem? How do problem? we solve solar erosion? Science and sweat, my friends, science and sweat. Uh, the way we solve the soil erosion problem is we, we find better solutions. Why does soil erode? Because we have to till it. Why do we have to till it? For pest management, for pest control, weeds and insects and other, and disease. We also have to till it because it becomes compressed because our traction systems go across it. And those are, those traction systems are heavy. Now imagine what would happen if you're not putting uh, a big heavy tractor across your system, but if you're doing virtually all of your, I can't back up here, but if you're doing virtually all of your uh, cultivation systems with a piece of equipment the size of a lawnmower, a riding lawnmower, but not just one, 20 of them, swarms of them, integrated, doing all the cultivations. I can't till, but you know what? You don't have to till the soil most of the time if you have other means of pest control. And you can drill plant with those small systems because you don't have to, it doesn't require that much torque to move a system across the soil. And that means you don't compress it, which means that you don't, and, and that means you never take a cover off of it. Naked soil is an affront to God. That's a, um, that's a paraphrase, I'm sorry, Pastor. Uh, but but it, it, naked soil is not natural. It, is, it only happens in natural disasters on this planet. It's, it, so you, need, you see a, a, a bare field, you need to think natural disaster. We, it's not easy. We're looking at cover crops as mechanisms to reduce and other technologies to reduce uh, soil erosion, but really it's keeping it covered. Something on it. That's the big key. We have another question online. It says, uh, notwithstanding the ethical considerations, would you consider artificial meat proteins designed and produced in lab from stem cells an option? Yuck. <laughs> No, no, never, 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 no, no. The most efficient way to produce muscular tissue protein from an ecological and an economic perspective is to get a chicken or a fish. Why would you 
get a petri dish when you can get a chicken or a fish. I just don't understand it. Well, I do understand it. I know exactly where it comes from. And they're going broke because my response is pretty much your response. Um, so people who, here's the thing. If you don't like meat, don't eat meat. I, that's it. I'm, 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 that's it. If you don't like meat, don't eat meat. But don't try to make non-animal meat because, again, I, I don't mean to bring the creator into this conversation again, but yuck. Any other questions from online or the, oh, got one over here. So the no, question is, does the economic development no, require population growth? We're going to find out. <laughs> this is the challenge. So about, let's see, you guys, we'll do the math here. About the time you're a little older than me, world population is going to tap, uh, tap uh, table off and start dropping. So you're going to have to figure out, ask our economists friends in the room, how you have an, uh, a growing economy when you have decreasing demand. What do you do when suddenly there are fewer people demanding the things that we buy? If we're in a capitalist system where demand is what drives su uh, supply and the supply demand growth curves lead to uh, what elasticity in the markets that, that create some resiliency. I just told you everything I know about economics in that sentence, by the way. So um, what I could tell you is that that growing populations around the world, the sort of lag in growing populations are going to save the developed economies if we can stop doing stupid, which is the name of my new podcast that I'm developing, Stop Doing Stupid. Uh, because think about it. We need labor. I'm building a house off the grid in Arkansas, northwest Arkansas, and my Spanish is not great, but it got better over the last three months as I worked with our construction crews. I roofed houses to put myself through college, and those guys are the best construction people I've ever seen in my life. And I've worked with a lot of construction people. And those guys mostly came from Guatemala. Uh, and so does that mean that, that, why are they doing that construction? That's the nature of immigration. Your grandparents, if you came here voluntarily, your ancestors came here voluntarily, did the work that no one else wanted to do. Some of your ancestors came here involuntarily and they did the work they were forced to do. And for that, there is no compensation that's good enough. But the fact is, that's our challenge. We need immigration in, in growing economies to keep stability and keep labor forces functioning. We're at about 80% capacity in meat processing facilities, labor capacity. That's the reason your bacon prices and beef prices went so up during COVID is because you couldn't run those processing facilities. And then um, people didn't come back to them. And so now we're at about 80% capacity. We don't have labor to process the food we grow right now. We don't have labor to pick the vegetables we grow right now. We're gonna to have to do something different. I think automation integrated with, so to move people away from the knives and away from the sun are two of the things we're gonna to have to do. Bend over, my, I have a PhD in biosystems engineering from a land grant university because my mother as a 10 year old kid picked cotton. That was their pathway to prosperity. We should always respect the dignity of hard work, but we should never exploit labor. Those are the tensions we have. And so short answer is it's going to be a rough road in 100 years. Good luck for labor because there are not going to be enough people. That's why you need the robots. Embrace the robots. We got one more question online. Uh, consumer waste, food thrown away in wealthy countries, That what role could redistribution of those surpluses play? Oh, goodness, this is a major concern. Um, I was at the American Acad Association for the Advancement of Sciences, AAAS, last week in Denver. And we had several uh, several sessions on food waste. It's risen to the level of concern of scientists around the world, certainly around the nation. The numbers can range from 20 to 40 percent post-consumer food is thrown away. That is to say, for every dollar of food uh, you spend on food, 40, 40 cents of that gets thrown in the trash. Well, first of all, that's and remember, stop doing stupid. Um, we got to figure out how to fix that. Part of it's the, the nature of our food distribution system. It's centralized and you got to get your car to go get stuff. And so we do the buckboard load up for, for a month and haul it back and stack the fridge with stuff. And by the time you find that chicken that you put in the back of the fridge, it's too late. So that's part of the reason we have waste. Part of the reason we have waste is consumers don't know how to manage food post-consumer. So I'm not answering the, the question here. The short answer to the question 
is until until we deal with the food waste issue, all the other metrics of sustainability don't matter. They just don't matter. I could reduce all the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in fact, we think we can make agriculture in the U.S. carbon negative and at the production level, at the farm gate. But if you're going to throw 40% of it away, what's it matter? So we got to figure that out. We've got to figure that out. And now, guess what we throw it away? Because it's so darn cheap. We throw it away because it's cheap. Remember the French Revolution? Our government sure does. That's why we have, because of our cheap food policy, that means that every dollar that you spend on food, about 18 cents of it on fresh fruits and vegetables, the high value stuff, goes to the farmer. For row crop agriculture, it's often half that goes to the farmer. This is a high volume, low profit, low yield, low margin production system in the United States. We got to change that. We got to love our food more. And that means we got to pay a little bit more for it. That's why local food movements make sense to me. Now, people who can afford to pay more should pay more. Food is both a human right, or it's all, it's all these things. It's a human right. It's a cultural expression. It's a biophysical necessity. Uh, it's also a luxury for many of us. So all those things make it really difficult to have a common policy about food, let alone a common attitude. And those things are going to have to change too. How many of you guys cook? I'm looking at you. All right. If you're not cooking, start. Uh, you, you need to start cooking because let me tell you, what's the cheapest meal you can make? You get a pound of beans, you soak them overnight, you boil them, maybe you put some bacon in them, some garlic and some onions, and you and and you've got yourself a meal for a week, and it costs five dollars, and it's relatively healthy. Well, it's very healthy without the bacon, but I'm not going to eat it without the bacon. So that's my point that you have access. We in the United States have access to affordable, healthy food, but we don't use that access. And that's all part of the same system. We have a broken food nutrition system. We have a very effective food production system, a broken food nutrition system. And did you have any questions for them that you wanted to? All right, I'll stay over here. I'll stay behind my cage. How many of you want a career in some sector of agriculture? One. All right, Dean, we failed. All right. <laughs> you have more work to do. You've got their emails, right? That's right. Badger them. Badger them. The opportunities in agriculture are immense. How many of you see yourself staying in Mississippi your whole life? Two. All right. Uh, Governor, you've got a problem uh, because this is the other problem we in the southern states have is that we're losing our smartest kids. How many of you see yourself staying in the United States the rest of your life? Wrong. At least half of you will be working elsewhere. That's where the that's where the jobs will be. That you don't have a choice. You're gonna want to you're gonna want to go to work for Bungie. I heard someone say they're gonna work for Bungie Corporation. I'm looking at you, Ag Economist. Bungie Corporation, US Bungie is a great organization. They're a global company. You'll be working all over the world. Uh, that's great. It's fantastic. It also means you gotta change, you gotta grow, you gotta learn. All right. I think that any you guys have any other questions for me? One final question. Any final? Yes, sir. Uh, what is happening recently? Unfortunately, yeah. Um, I'm from Ghana in West Africa, and Ghana is the largest producer of cocoa in the whole world. But unfortunately, the problem is. These arable lands that are used for cocoa production also have large deposits of gold. So there's a gold rush. So all these farms are gradually turning into uh, mining fields and we lose the agriculture. So I want to know if um, there are some plans or some um, projects that advanced countries can do to support, you know, African countries in that regard. I think the same problem is happening in Mali, Congo, and other countries. Yeah. Well, I, I shared with you, I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, the reason my ancestors were removed from Georgia and my cousin's ancestors, my wife's ancestors from Mississippi, Alabama, um, and into moved into Oklahoma in 1835, almost 200 years ago, was because they found gold in Georgia. Um, in the, in the hills in Georgia where the Cherokee lived. And the governor wanted that gold for his prosperity of, of white people. 
And so, and again, I'm half German. Look at me, my mother and her whole family are German. So it's hard for me to hate white people because I am white people. Uh, that's kind of all of us, right? We're all kind of in this thing together. So what happened historically isn't a cause for hate. What happens today is a cause for concern. Uh, so let's I want to separate that. What's happening, I've worked with the World Cocoa Foundation in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to try to figure out what, because they're also shifting to maize. The problem with cocoa, who doesn't like chocolate? Who does not like chocolate? One person doesn't like chocolate. You're a, you're a communications specialist. You got to keep that quiet because people will, people will move away from you. All right, I mean, it's, it's it, so it's, it's a agroforestry product and it can take 10 years for a cocoa tree to reach its full production capacity. And so you can't just replace it tomorrow. It takes 10 years. And many of those plantations were planted during the, the British Empire days. And so they're sort of, I think it was British and Ghana, right? So, and so those were old plantations that were then divided up to family groups for land ownership and management. The, I, I always try to stay away from politics, but the reality is that some of our solutions for these things like food come from uh, capitalism, Profit's a great motive. That's what's happening with gold. Some of it comes from government regulations where we as a people decide this is better for us than just profit, that this matters more to us collectively than the profit for a few. And therefore we make policies that restrict certain behaviors. And that's what is required in those situations. And I say that while somewhere in Mississippi, incredibly fertile ag land is being paved over to put a stop and go in right now because we are developing fertile ag land and we have no policies in the United States to protect it, none. Uh, it's just simply who pays the highest bidder. It's straight on the market. And I can tell you, capitalism, Norm expressed this frustration too, capitalism doesn't solve problems capitalism makes. It does not solve those problems. It takes other interventions to solve those problems and we don't have very many tools in our toolbox. Basically what we have there are government interventions, policies, locals, state, federal, in the United States. So that's what it's gonna take, government intervention and restrictions. But that's a, a way till they discover lithium. I think gold's valuable. Well, let's thank our speaker today, Dr. Matlock. And we have something for you. So he he drove here from uh, Fayetteville and he'll be, he'll be driving back. So we got you a nice, care package of uh, some goodies from our experiment station to munch on on your on your way back home if you don't if you don't if you don't want the lemon straws I know somebody that will uh, take those off their hands but thank you appreciate it thank you so much Dr. Matlock uh, so for those of you in attendance uh, here in the theater um, you're welcome to stay for lunch in the auditorium if you would like to we have plenty but uh, otherwise, thank you for attending today and uh, for the Youth Institute participants, please go ahead and move into the auditorium. Appreciate it. And for those of you that joined online, thank you so much for attending.